This section is an introduction to economic base analysis and the derivation of basic sector multipliers for community analysis. When we think about our economy, we often think at the national level, sometimes at the state level. But for most planners, we characterize economies on a regional or on a smaller community basis. So we think in terms of regional and community markets. In so doing, then, we need to characterize and understand our economy conceptually. We need to know who the businesses and actors are in our economy, what were the dominant organizations or institutions, um, and government, the roles of these, of these different actors within our economy. Our economy also has a spatial dimension. It's where goods and services are produced and sold and where consumption takes place. All of these dimensions, these spatial dimensions, have a factor in the well-being of our regional economy. Now, this third item, the consequence of economic change for people and communities, is very important to understand because now we're talking about the potential impacts as your economy changes. When an economy changes, let's say you lose jobs in an industry, there are other impacts besides just the direct or the, the basic sector job losses. And we'll talk about what constitutes a basic sector. On the other hand, there are things that some people may think of that constitute economic growth or economic decline that may not be the case. So it's important to us to learn how to understand when an economy is growing or poised for growth and when it is not growing and is stagnant. An easy way to characterize our regional economy is to think in terms of, of, a, of a territory, a region of interest, and that we have transactions within that economy. You and I buy from one another. My income is based on your purchases. Your income is based on my purchases. So we think about that in our economy. We also know our economy, though, can't produce all the goods and services that we need, so we have to import goods and services into our economy. If we produce in excess of regional demand, we have the opportunity to export our surplus to other areas. And so this is a simplified view of a regional economy, and we can put this into an equation. And in this equation, what we're going to do is we're going to get a handle. This is a, a simplified Keynesian income determination model. But my, my economy, Y, my dollars in my economy are going to be a function of these these few terms here. The first one is going to be consumption, and that's what I just talked about. You and I buying from one another, um, my business buying from your business, your business buying from my business, my household buying from your, your service um, business, your service business employing my household and creating the capacity for somebody in my household to buy goods and services in my economy. So that's number, that's the first term, C. The next way we generate, and we just talked about this, extra income in our economy is exporting our surplus production. That brings money into our economy from the outside, and we're satisfying what's called external, or in economics term, an exogenous demand. We can't procure everything we need to make us happy in our local economy, so we rely on imports. And that has a minus sign in front of it. For every dollar that we send out to buy an import or a good, that's a dollar that's no longer in my economy. That good is in our economy because we imported it and we may be able to do productive things with that import. But that dollar has left our economy no matter what. And then there's a lot of other things, the plus or minus Oh, other stuff which is composed of savings, which becomes investment, government payments and taxes, those types of things that, that, that uh, can constitute the foundation either of public services or of the possibility for investment and growth in a regional economy. But in the short run, we increase our economy by increasing our exports, and that's because money is coming in from external sources. And by increasing our exports, usually through the attraction of a manufacturing industry or something like that, uh, we increase the amount of money that's coming in from the outside and we increase the amount of local employment that's producing for an external consumption source. Another way for an economy to increase is to decrease imports in industrial production as well as in services that are geared towards household consumption. So the more that we do to replace imports with localized production, 
that money stays in our economy and does have a chance to multiply through. We call this import substitution. And then the third and fourth ways in which we can enhance a regional economy, perhaps by savings yielding more local investment, it creates the capacity for our economy to grow, or we could seek subsidies or government investment in our community. And in the 1990s, many communities did just that. They sought, during tough times, they sought to get governments to underwrite, for example, prisons in their county or some other type of public building or, or institution in their county as a mechanism for economic development. We normally characterize our economies thinking in terms of a, of a dominant central place, a major city or a regional trade center. And a regional trade center or, or a central place is probably the most useful way to characterize our economies, whether it's a micropolitan area that satisfies most of the employment needs of a surrounding county, or maybe a metropolitan area that, that encompasses um, a, a significant geographic territory. Nonetheless, these central places, we think of these as places that where we have a consolidation of goods and services production. Goods and services, let's, let's have a basic introduction to our industrial structure. We tend to characterize industries in a, in a variety of dichotomous ways. One of the initial ways that you'll notice if you look at government statistics is that we do distinguish between farm and non-farm activities in the economy. We also distinguish between private sector and non-private. The non-private sector is, is primarily government, local, state, and federal government production. A third way that we characterize our economy, and it's a way that, that will, will lend itself to the subsequent analysis, uh, are, are firms that produce goods, tangible items, versus firms that produce services. Goods are like manufacturing or agricultural goods, mining goods, constructed goods, buildings and such. So those are goods. And all other industries are classified very broadly as service industries. They're providing services or household goods, like retail trade. They're providing household goods to, to families. We also think in terms of manufacturing and non-manufacturing. Finally, we start to characterize our economies, and this applies to this lecture, in terms of our basic sectors and our non-basic sectors. And our basic sectors are generally those sectors that are producing for export and our non-basic sectors either support our basic sectors or they otherwise assist in local production, the, the production of goods and services for local consumption. We get our economic data for this type of analysis from four basic sources. The best place for county level data is the Bureau of Economic Analysis. It's called its Regional Economic Information System. So if you go to the BEA.gov and look at local or state uh, income uh, data, you'll find employment and income by industry information for the counties or the states in the United States. Second source is county business patterns. We can also get information from county business patterns at the zip code level, but county business patterns has a lot of industrial detail, especially in terms of business establishments. The census of industry is done every five years by the U.S. Department of Commerce, and that gives us a highly detailed characterization of, that comes out every five years, 2002, 2007, 2012, the survey that was done in 2012, those data will be available in a few years. And then finally, we get good information about earnings as well as employment and occupation from the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the BLS. Now we're moving into the basics of economic base analysis. It's a very simplified, but it's a useful way to characterize our regional economy. And I've already introduced this. We have basic firms, and these are firms that depend in whole or very significantly on external factors, exogenous factors. That means that they're producing for export. They are satisfying external demand, and because they're satisfying external demand, they're bringing money into this region that otherwise wouldn't have come into this region, but for our production of this good for their use. Or to state it a different way, but for their demand for what we produce, this money would not be in our economy. Next, we have the non-basic firms, and these are all industries that depend 
on local business conditions that could be household consumption or another local business condition would be um, supplying inputs into the basic firms so you're either producing for an external market or you're producing for an internal market external market is basic internal market is non-basic and this is what we get then when we reduce the economic base to a very very simple formula all activity is basic or non-basic, therefore all employment equals basic plus non-basic. And if all non-basic employment is driven by changes in the basic sector, then we can get a multiplier M. And the multiplier is going to be total employment divided by the basic employment. Or to state it a different way, total employment in an area is the multiplier times basic employment in an area. Well, we have to determine what this multiplier is, which means that we have to come up with a with a, a count of our basic jobs. One way is to do a survey of local firms and ask them to divide their sales between local and non-local purchases and ask households to divide their purchases by local and non-local sources. This is very costly and its accuracy is an issue and I've never seen one that's been done well. I've seen these types of surveys conducted, but they're not done at the level of accuracy and detail that would allow someone to do a good job of estimating a basic sector. We have an indirect method of base determination or basic sector determination and that's called the assumption or the ad hoc method and in this we just simply assume certain sectors are producing for export. So agriculture primarily produces for export sales, mining, manufacturing, tourism by definition must be an export sale. You cannot be a tourist locally. And then of course state and federal institutions, prisons, colleges, military bases you're locally providing a good or service that serves or satisfies the needs of a much larger external population. Here we have an example of, we'll, we'll work through coming up with a multiplier. In this case, I've got an economy. And in this economy, we have, we have determined sets of basic sectors. There's 500 jobs in agriculture. There's 65 jobs in mining. All of these are considered on an ad hoc or assumption basis to be producing for external markets. Manufacturing, 1,800 jobs. Three categories of tour tourism, hotels, casinos, and all other. This, this uh, community has a military base and it also has a prison. So we could sum all of these up and come up with the total basic jobs in that economy of 5,740. The rest of the economy has 3,800 jobs and the total jobs in the economy are 9,540. So our base or basic multiplier then or is the total jobs divided by the basic jobs or 9,540 the total employment divided by the basic jobs of 5,740 basic jobs and that gives us a multiplier of 1.66. This multiplier means that for every basic job change, either growth or loss, the whole economy, including the basic job, has 1.66 jobs. And so the interpretation is that for every change in basic jobs, the non-basic economy will change by 66 one hundredths of a job. So for example, if a basic firm added 100 jobs, then the whole economy would grow by 166 jobs. This is a basic multiplier and this is one of the ways in which we may evaluate the, the consequences of growth in a regional economy. One last point on the base multiplier. There is no multiplier to be applied to non-basic job changes. If my community puts in a new grocery store, grocery stores satisfy local demand. That's a non-basic sector. That's not what you apply the multiplier towards. Under economic base analysis, the multiplier under this kind of evaluation is only applied to businesses that are producing for export demand or exogenous demand, our basic sector. The other part of this multiplier is that it's applied to all basic sectors. We just have one multiplier. So regardless of job levels or income levels, the earnings per job, or their respective linkages to the local economy, we would use the same basic multiplier whether we were talking about a manufacturing change or changes in the prison or the military base or the casino. We'll have more complicated multiplier derivations coming up in, in subsequent 
sessions, but this is a basic introduction to multipliers, how they're used, and how they're interpreted.